consider the Gospel of Luke, we will be looking at the fourth chapter. So if you would turn with me there, Luke chapter 4, we'll be looking at verses 16 through 30. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 30. Let us read God's Word together. And he, that's Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up for uh, three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. So far the reading from God's Word this morning. Well, I hope you notice there's a a remarkable shift that takes place in our passage this morning. In verse 16, Jesus is the favored son of Nazareth. And in verse 29, they're trying to throw him off a cliff that... He would meet his demise. What happened? What happened in between verse 16 and and verse 29? It couldn't have been more than than half hour to 45 minutes, this transition that takes place in Jesus' popularity. Well, the people of Nazareth are, are very keen on Jesus when he is saying what they want to hear. But as soon as he speaks the words that they don't want to hear, as soon as he challenges their habits, as soon as he challenges the way they think about God's deliverance in the world, they become incensed, and they move from love to hatred in in a matter of minutes. So what we want to do with this passage is uh, look at uh, the two emotions that are brought out in it. So first we're going to look at the love that the people have for Jesus in verses 16 through 22. And then we're going to look at the hatred that they have for Jesus in verses 23 through 29. So they love him in verses 16 to 22, and they hate him in verses 23 through 29. Let's begin by looking at verse 16. Jesus comes to Nazareth, the place where he had been brought up. You remember from verses 13 and 14 and 15 that Jesus, under the power of the Holy Spirit, comes out of these temptations that he has faced, and and he begins an itinerant ministry, so to speak. He begins going around the synagogues in Galilee, and he begins preaching, teaching uh, in their synagogues. And the people at that point were receiving him with enthusiasm. They were glorifying him at the beginning of his ministry. And so as part of his circuit, he returns to Nazareth. It's a small town in Galilee. Galilee is uh, the province where Jesus was operating. And so there Jesus returns to his hometown, 
perhaps to visit his mother or his family. It's not said the nature of his visit, but uh, he returns to his hometown. Uh, you remember Joseph and Mary uh, from chapter 2 returning to Nazareth and raising Jesus and the other siblings there. And so the people of Nazareth have watched Jesus grow up. They have seen him mature. Maybe they've even hired uh, Joseph and him to do carpentry work uh, for them as part of uh, their vocation in their town. But more significant than how they may have known him outside of the synagogue, they have known him inside the synagogue. You remember, Jesus is the one who, as a 12-year-old in Jerusalem, uh, mesmerized all who heard him as he sat at the feet of the teachers in the temple asking them questions and, and answering them. Well, if that may be true of Jesus as a 12-year-old three days in the presence of the people in Jerusalem, how much more would that be true for the people in Nazareth? Uh, they have seen him in synagogue. They have probably heard him read from the scrolls before. And so when Jesus returns to his hometown, he does that which is natural to him. He goes to the synagogue. He goes on the Sabbath, on Saturday. He goes to worship uh, with his fellow Nazarenes or Nazarites. He is a Jesus. He's a, he's a Sabbatarian. He wouldn't miss synagogue. He goes to worship every Sabbath day. And so he does, as is his custom here in Nazareth as well. And as we have reflected a little bit on the background and remembered Jesus as a 12-year-old, it's not really surprising that when he returns to the synagogue that they would ha hand a scroll to him. It seems to be something of a custom in that time that men in the synagogue would be asked to read and teach. And it's not surprising then that they would uh, hand the scroll to Jesus as well. Uh, the synagogue attendant hands him the scroll of Isaiah. He hands it to uh, Naz Nazareth's young prodigy that he would have a chance to speak, this young rabbi with so much promise. And so Jesus opens the scroll. You remember, of course, that they didn't have chapters and verses like we have today. And so Jesus had to know where he was going in his scroll. He had to find his place just by knowing the scroll. He couldn't rely on numbers and verses. And so Jesus, as he opens the scroll, he opens it to Isaiah in our Bibles, Isaiah chapter 61 and verses 1 and 2. And it's a section of the prophet Isaiah that deals with the restoration of the people of Israel. In, in Isaiah, there is much about the judgment of God. There's much about how Israel has fallen short of, of the Lord and fallen into idolatry and, and that therefore they will be judged. But beginning in chapter 60, uh, all the way through to chapter 62, there is a, a large section that deals with the day of the Lord's favor. In the evening worship service, we're reading through Isaiah, uh, and we're starting at the beginning. And there we're reading about what? We're reading about the day of the Lord in terms of judgment. Well, here at the end of Isaiah, there's a section that deals with the day of the Lord in terms of restoration, in terms of, of blessing, in terms of the people of Israel uh, being brought back into his favor. It's not uh, unusual in the prophets to have this kind of a progression moving from judgments towards restoration, towards uh, deliverance. And that's where Jesus is. He's in the middle of a section that deals uh, with the day of the Lord's favor. Some think it deals with a year of jubilee. Uh, there, in the prophet Isaiah, the, the progression has been completed, moving from the day of judgment to the day of jubilee, the day of favor. And so from this prophecy of good news, these three chapters in Isaiah... Jesus chooses less than one and a half verses to read. He chooses 1.3 verses, one and a third verses, and he reads them to his listeners. Now, why does Jesus choose these words? It seems like the people who are listening to him aren't sure either. He rolls up the scroll, it says in verse 20, after reading of this Spirit of the Lord being on him, and the things that Jesus is supposed to do, and, and the people in the synagogue have their eyes fixed on him. 
There were no sleepers in the synagogue on that Sabbath morning. Uh, they were captivated by his words. All their eyes were on him. And as they wait, he rolls up the scroll and he gives it back to the attendant and he begins to teach them. And what does he say to them? He says, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What does that mean? What is Jesus saying when he reads that passage of the deliverance of Israel? And he says, Today, when you heard me read these words, this prophecy has been fulfilled. Well, Jesus is making a tremendous statement. He's saying that the Spirit of the Lord is on Jesus. That He is the one anointed to proclaim good news to the poor. That He is the one who is sent to free captives. He is the one who gives sight to the blind. He is the one who sets at liberty the oppressed. And most significant, He is the one who is here to proclaim the Lord's favor. The doom of Israel is over. Jesus is here to usher in the year of the Lord's favor. He is here to usher in the jubilee that the people of Israel have been expecting. And in verse 22, you see the people of Nazareth, they, they eat it up. It's exactly what they wanted to hear. Finally, somebody who is bringing us good news. Get rid of this tetrarch, Herod Antipas. Tell his Roman henchman Pontius Pilate to take a hike. Throw Tiberius Caesar from the throne like in the good old days of Judas Maccabeus. Let us be a free country again. That's right. Isn't Joseph's boy one of ours? Doesn't he belong to Nazareth? That's right. He's one of ours. Listen to him talk. Listen to him thunder. Freedom for Israel. Freedom from the oppression of Rome. The people of Nazareth love what Jesus is saying. So much so that they're amazed at its, at its words, at his words. That these people, they're, they're coming to terms with what Jesus has said even. That here is this man, this son of a carpenter who is going to usher in the Lord's special favor on Israel and he announces it here first. Here in Nazareth, Jesus comes and tells us these words of grace. And they marvel. They marvel at what Jesus has said. They love Him. They love Him a lot. But what we're going to see in verses 23 through 29 is that love for Jesus quickly turns to hatred. And so it's as if Jesus anticipates this hatred in verses 23 and 24, isn't it? Uh, Jesus starts issuing warnings. If, if Jesus was on earth uh, to gather support for his cause, he would have stopped in verse 21, wouldn't he? He would have been satisfied with the adoration of the people around him. But it seems like Jesus isn't satisfied. It seems like Jesus has something else that he needs to say to the people of Nazareth, and he knows. He knows they're not going to like it. And so he begins uh, with this saying this proverb, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum to here in your hometown as well. That's how Jesus begins to challenge uh, their assumptions. They want, the people of Nazareth, they want to own Jesus, don't they? They want to make him their hometown pride. I don't know how many of you drive to Charleston, South Carolina ever. We drive to Charleston, South Carolina. And you drive through a little town in South Carolina called Bamberg. And what, what greets you, those of you who have made that drive, what greets you as soon as you hit Bamberg? Home of Nikki Haley. The hometown pride. There are banners of it everywhere, it seems like to me, when I drive through a town. They're proud of uh, this native daughter. That's what Nazareth wants to do with Jesus. They want to make him their hometown pride. 
They're saying to him, or Jesus is anticipating what they will say to him, whatever you did in Capernaum, where Jesus is living now, whatever you did there, all these miracles and, and these signs, do that here also, that we would be famous too, that we would bask in your fame, and that we would be well known. Make us proud, Jesus, son of Joseph. And Jesus is anticipating that, and he is saying by way of warning, that no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Jesus is anticipating what will happen next. In verse 24, he is acknowledging he's about to say something they don't want to hear. And he has uh, testimony from prophets who have gone before him, knowing uh, that those who hear prophets who are familiar with them don't like to hear their words. They will most of the time reject the prophets, and Jesus is saying, they think they own him, but they will reject him as well. And why is that? It's because the people of Nazareth don't respect Jesus as the anointed one. They like what he says if it scratches their itch. That's what they want him to do. They want him to be a mouthpiece for their glory. It's, of course, a, a common response to God's word. We see it in the response that people have to People like me, pastors, right? I mean, I know what goes on. I was on that side of the pulpit for 40 years. I know what it's like uh, to sit on that side and to hear a man say something to you that you uh, don't like. It's the easiest thing. I've done it myself. When you don't like the message, uh, to discount the messenger, isn't it? What does he know? He's just a kid. How long has he been a pastor anyways? Didn't he spend a couple of decades up in Canada? That's probably where he's got these crazy ideas. How could he even say these things uh, to us? Uh, you know, I know his sins. And maybe you finish up with something like this. It's a good thing his wife and kids are nice, right? That's... This is how we deal with words that hurt from the Lord. Contempt for the messenger without consideration of the biblical truth of the message. It's the easiest way to deal with things we don't like. And that's what the people of Nazareth do here. Familiarity in their case breeds contempt. They say, we know, we know this Jesus. He's Joseph's son. How dare he talk to us that way? He's one of us. He's nothing special at all. And so Jesus gives two corrections in anticipation of their assumptions. He gives the, the one example is Elijah being sent to the widow in Zarephath. The second one is Elisha healing the leper Naaman. In both of those examples, there is one thing in common. Where did Elijah stay during the famine? He stayed in Sidon. Sidon is Gentile country. There are no Israelites up there at all. And when Naaman comes at the, the request of his captured Hebrew servant girl, he comes as the commander of which army? The army of David or the army of the Syrians? The enemies of David. And so Jesus points out to them, that these two people cared for and by God's favor are, are Gentile. They're not Hebrews at all. And the people of Nazareth know exactly uh, what Jesus is saying. They wanted a Hebrew kingdom. They don't want Gentiles to be on equal footing with them. They want a Hebrew kingdom. They want Rome destroyed. They want David restored. But Jesus is, he's including Gentiles. What does that do for the people of Nazareth? Well, for the people of Nazareth, that's worth killing somebody over. They take Jesus, they run him out of town, and they're about to throw him off a cliff. A few minutes ago, he was the favored son in a matter of sentences later, he has become worth killing. 
They want to throw him off the cliff. Why? Why that change? Oh, they're at odds with the anointed one. They're at odds with the prophet. They want man's words. They want their own ideas of restoration for Israel. They don't want this restoration of the Gentiles. We are the favored people. They want man's words, not the Lord's. And it introduces for us something that is, uh, runs throughout Jesus' ministry, isn't it? Jesus runs into problems not because he does great miracles for people, does not he? He runs into problems because of what he says after he does the miracles. He gets in trouble because of his words, because he says things that people don't want to hear. He fights with the Pharisees. Does he fight against their obedience to God's law, or does he fight against the words of man that they're laying on other people? He fights against tradition. He fights against uh, the kingdom of man. He fights against those who would be their own God and make others be their followers. And so these people of Nazareth, they've had enough of this upstart, this, this prima donna. And they grab him, and they walk him to the cliff on which their city is built, and they're about to throw him down so that he would fall to his demise, shattered on the rocks that lie at the bottom. And then we see something miraculous in verse 30. Jesus passes through their midst. He went away. He goes untouched through their midst. It's miraculous. The people of Israel, of course, have been used uh, for centuries to dealing with the prophets as they saw fit. If they grabbed one of these men of old, they could have easily thrown him off the cliff and have him meet his demise. But there's something different about this Jesus of Nazareth. It's not his time uh, to be killed. He will be killed, to be sure. But now is not that time, not at the hands of a mob, and not at the hands of the people of Nazareth. They will uh, kill him, but in the Lord's timing, so that the Lord's will uh, would be done. So the people of Nazareth hate this Jesus because uh, he does not speak what they want to hear. And it marks the very nature of Jesus' ministry, the offense that he causes in telling people what they don't want to hear. So what do we learn from that ourselves? Well, I think the first thing that we learn from this passage is that we are called to love Christ and conform ourselves uh, to him. It's a simple thing, but it's a difficult thing at times, isn't it? You know, we are called as God's people to conform ourselves to the word that he has given to us. So when God's word shows us a sin, there's only one right response to it, and that's repentance. When your brother comes to you in humility to speak to you of something that he sees, even if it's your husband or the other way around, even if it's your wife, the one with whom you are perhaps most familiar. What's the only right response? It's consideration. It's study. It's looking at whether or not God's Word actually does say this. And if it does say this, we're back to part one. Repentance. This is how we respond to the conviction of God's Word. It's, His Word, it, it shakes us sometimes. And God, in His great wisdom, isn't always considerate as to where He shakes us. Sometimes He, he shakes us in places where, where we have been comfortable for decades. And He calls us to conform ourselves to His Word. He calls us to not be like the people in Nazareth. He calls us to set ourselves under His Word, not above His Word. Those are the only two options that we have. You realize that. When we hear God's Word, we either place ourselves above it in defiance, or we place ourselves under it 
in a joyful, loving obedience to our Savior. So, love Christ and conform yourself to Him. The second thing that we can learn from this passage is is to recognize that the world is God's. The people of, of Nazareth, what were they? They were ethnically focused, weren't they? They were thinking about this small group of people coming from the loins of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, hoping to see God's favor rest on them as a a peculiar people. They didn't want people who weren't like them in their special group. Sometimes we see it when we we let our children form special clubs, right? They want certain people in the club and they don't want other people in the club. We do that because of personal preference usually. Well, it's the same thing for Israel. They are ethnically focused and they they don't want other kinds of people in their group. We as a church, we can be that way too, can't we? We can look around, say these people don't sound like me, they don't look like me, they don't smell like me, they don't talk like me, and therefore they're not welcome here. Would we at Cliffwood be willing to have the Lord's plan established for His church rather than our own? Do we have a group of people that we would prefer? Some that we would exclude? Do they have to look a certain way? Do they have to behave a certain way? Do they have to talk? Do they have to know the right vocabulary to be in on the inside? This is the church of God and it is universal. It's part of what Jesus is teaching to the people of Nazareth as well. So when Christ comes to Nazareth, they love him. But when he speaks truth, it very quickly turns to hatred. Now what of us? When we are confronted with God's word, where will we find ourselves? Will we find ourselves sitting in judgment over the anointed one of the Lord and his word? Or by by God's grace, will we let its promises shape our very lives? Let's pray.